Okay, so without further ado, this is our 12th garden session of the, for the Warwick Zoom Garden Plot. Welcome. Like usual, we'll do the questions and answers, uh, got a weekly update, a couple announcements, and then uh, we'll have a discussion of our favorite garden tools. And uh, Alexandra is going to do a... Right. Alexandra is in the weekly update. Oh, so, okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> this first question... Yeah, maybe, we can mute, maybe we can mute everybody that uh, is not talking. It's a Zoom uh, garden program from Greenwood Lake. From what? Greenwood, Greenwood Lake? Lake? Yeah. <laughs> um, All right, let's see. I'd rather just listen to the book. Um, just a second. Yeah, yeah maybe if you read everyone. Yeah. I had to go off, stop sharing to do that. So you can take your own, you can take yourself off mute when you want to talk. Okay, now I'm going to go back to sharing the screen. So one of the things that I just tried to pick up from the, from the garden Zoom was that, you know, when you're trying to get things started in the middle of the summer, if you just put them out in the garden, it's tough. Some days it's really hot, then the rain pounds down on them. It's really hard to protect them. And so Bill was saying, you could start your things like these beets, you could start them in little containers and then transplant. Well, the first time I tried it, uh, they didn't have enough light, so they grew up so spindly, well, never mind those. So this was my second set. And, and actually this set, um, I, I left them outside most of the time. But if it was really, they were in a shop place that got afternoon shade. And if it was like really windy or really hot, I could bring them in. Um, but, you know, pay close attention to them and give them a very sheltered, relatively sheltered environment. When I went to transplant, gosh, the only time that I've ever transplanted these things before is they're practically root bound. You know, you go to the store, you get a squash or something. It's, there's all roots in there. These guys, the, the roots were so teeny tiny. It's like you could hardly get them out. You know, it, it was, it just didn't come out as one. So I was wondering, I mean, should I be waiting till they're like much bigger to transplant or what, 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 what advice do you have for me on this? I would let them grow some more. Are they Swiss chard or spinach? No, 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 they're um, beets. Beets. I would let them grow a little bit more. Those are very young seedlings. And unless you're going to put shade cover over them and keep them really, no, really well watered, I don't think they'll make it. Okay. You, you transplant when you have two sets of leaves. Okay, so, and this would be considered one set of leaves? Right. You know, you sa Sarah, about, don't find it. Sorry, don't you find it hard to do like root vegetables? Don't I don't recommend? Uh, shouldn't you really kind of put those directly, like carrots and beets and and stuff like that? Or you could, you recommend you could transplant those? I mean, I've never started carrots. I've always direct seeded those, but I know um, people do start beets. I took you know one of uh, Barbara's classes, and also Carol. Cheryl Rogalski told me they start beets ahead of time because I didn't think you could transplant beets either. And I know getting them going in the summer is, is dicey, but those definitely need to be a little bit larger or I don't think they're going to make it in, in the uh, wilds of the garden. So is that, that's a single set of leaves and you say it should be a double? Right. That's a single set of leaves. And then, you know, a second set will come up. The other thing you might want to do is, if they're not growing very rapidly, pop them into like a three inch pot. And don't, don't mess around with them too much, but just pop them into a three inch pot. And that usually will boost their growth a little bit. Okay. But, um, did you soak your seeds? Yes, I did. Yeah. I just put some beets out on Sunday. 
hoping it would get cooler. And I'm going to go and try to water. You probably have to water them every day when you put them out also. Yep. Okay. But, yeah, too, too young. They're infants. Okay. Okay. Very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see. Oh, I didn't get this picture in right. Um, just a second. I'm going to stop sharing a minute. Oh, this is Carly. Maybe Carly could. Uh... <laughs> you want me to explain? Yeah, I guess right. Michael wants to pull the picture up, but I guess you will be. There you go. Go ahead. Explaining as well. Sure. So I um my question is just about kind of mildews, the, the late summer mildews, and um <clears throat> our plants got hit really fast, um and it it basically took over all the cucumbers and I've seen it kind of be spreading to the other plants. And I read that copper fungicide can help, but I also read that it will hurt bees. And so we don't want to use it. And um, we did test it on a few leaves and then we found a dead bee. So I, I didn't want to do anything else. Um, and so what I wanted to know is whether dramatic pruning would really help quelch it. And then also, um, I also read conflicting information about whether it will overwinter. And it, it seems like effective composting will help, um, but I'm just trying to figure out whether there's anything that we can do to salvage the crop that isn't gonna hurt anything. And then also what will happen after the winter and whether, you know, what, what we can do to, to deal with it. And if composting and the heat of composting will, will kill it off. Anyone have any advice? I, I, I thought the, you know, I, 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 from what I knew, uh, I think the copper was fairly uh, safe, but I, you know, I haven't done a ton of research on it. I probably should have researched it after you sent me that stuff. Does, but does anyone else have anything? Uh, that they, well, uh, yeah, once that, once that, mil, that mildew hits, it's hard to. Uh, and I wouldn't compost that, that. I would definitely not throw it in my compost. Yeah, I usually just throw those out. In the garbage? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I actually, this late in the season, I find the cucumbers just start to uh, wear themselves out between the, the heat and then they start getting the mildew. You're not, you're only gonna have like another week or two of cucumbers left. And the same with the zucchinis they start to have various problems and I've always really just let them go at this point. I've never really felt it was particularly worth the effort of trying to do any heroic efforts this late in the season. And I would not, I would not put those in the compost. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I think you got a pretty, I'm sure you got a pretty good run out of them. I think it's pretty much heading right. towards the end of its run. So it's not worth, you right. know, spraying and picking at this point. I, I think they're pretty much done in my opinion as well. For next year, you might look at uh, neem oil for powdery mildew. Um, some people have had success with that. Neem oil. Thank you. Yeah, neem, the other thing you can do next year is plant um, two groups. Put part of your plants out on the early side and then wait a few weeks and put out another set of plants and then you'll get a longer season of healthy plants. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're sick of cucumbers and zucchini by now, aren't you? <laughs> That's the other thing. <laughs> you have a time you're like... <laughs> Haven't you had any every variation of cucumber and zucchini humanly possible at this point? <laughs> Yes, and as have all of our neighbors. Exactly. It's like, all right, you want some more zucchini? <laughs> so should we just expect this every year? Because it does seem to happen like late summer, like right at the end of the season, it, show, it seems to show up. Yeah, I, I would say, I would say it usually does. And, and again, you know, there's a trouble when it shows up earlier, but at this point, 
if you if you got a good harvest from it and it's coming now then i would just again i would let it i would either pull it up at this point or uh you know again be uh you and your neighbors could be grateful to not have any more cucumbers or zucchini for the next few weeks I see Sarah just dropped out. She had frozen for a while. Maybe she will come back. Okay. I took this picture um, because I wanted to, this is actually a bunch of wasps. I got, I got bit by these guys and then I looked around and saw this wasp nest. Ouch. And so I was taking this picture of this wasp, but I was really amazed at all of the dew on that plant that morning. And got to asking if, if you, is, does do reduce the amount of watering needed? Yeah, I would say, yeah. I mean, yes, that's nature's uh, right. If you go out early in the morning, everything is, the grass is wet, the leaves are wet. So it's uh, definitely helpful. But again, but this is a pretty extreme summer. We've had some real scorchers on there. But, you know, again, my stuff's hanging in there, but it does... I, I would say it does reduce the amount of water it needed. And that's why, you know, mulch is good. You know, to me, dense planting is good as well. It all, all adds to, you know, retaining moisture. I, I would scratch the surface, go down an inch or two and see what the condition is under that. Right. Okay. By the way, Steve, I like your new number. Is that like, are you, your, your name is a number today. I, that's cute. I, you know what, I put it, it I, I accidentally put in the, uh, that's the uh, password. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, like that too. <laughs> do, let's see, there's one more question that, that somebody sent in, but actually that was me. And I've already asked two of the three questions. So I want to ask if anyone else has other questions they want to put in front of us today. I have a question. Um, I, I have a lot of packets of seeds because I, overbought this season because of the pandemic. I thought I'd be f having to feed myself and my family. Um, so basically, I've never had so many seed packets left over. What's the best way to store them till next summer, till next spring? Well, I, I'll, I'll take the answer. Um, my experience is I've put them in individually um, Ziploc plastic bags. Uh -huh. And I've also put them into the refrigerator. Some people say freezing them, but refrigerator seem to be fine. And I've had pretty good yields with over, uh, you know, the next year, even two years later, depending on the, depending on the seed. So you just put them in a plastic bag and put them in the back of the refrigerator? Yep. Okay. So what, do, you, do, you, do you freeze them or just the refrigerator part? I've only done the refrigerating, but I've heard that people have frozen seeds and have had success with that, but I've never done it. I've heard, I've heard that dry is an essential ingredient for keeping a seed for long. Yeah, that's what surprised right. me. Right. Dry. And I also overwinter my seeds and um, they've worked for you know several years. I don't put them in the refrigerator because of room, but I do. They have to be kept dry. Some people say those little dry packs that come in your shoes and all those things you buy, you should put those down in. And I keep them in my mudroom. My mudroom is not heated. It's warm enough, so it's like a cool temperature, but apparently it's, it's important to keep a cool, consistent temperature. And I would also suggest you look online, there are charts to tell you how long seeds last. Lettuce seeds last a long time, I know. Uh, tomatoes, peppers, beans, you can get a few years out of those. So, uh, no, you can definitely keep them. And you know how to test them in the spring, or we'll talk about that when spring comes. <laughs> no, I have no idea how you test them. <laughs> All right, we'll get to that. We'll get to that next next spring. <laughs> so, is the consensus refrigerate or not refrigerate, or well, either got, one? If you've got lots of them, why don't you try both? <laughs> okay. Yeah. There you go. And report back. 
or if you have room in your fridge. I just wanted to give you an option because of the refrigerator space might be a problem. Yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions? I guess you could ask your second question, no third. <laughs> So a friend of mine sent me this picture from his cell phone last week wow. and he harvested all these green tomatoes and I said, Jim, what is up with that? And he said, his strategy is if he takes them in like this, they'll ripen on the table and he'll lose maybe 10% of his crop. If he leaves them outside, between critters and blight and who knows what, he'll lose 40%. What do you think of Jim's strategy? And this is half of his crop. He had another, he had another table to get. He had to get another table. Go ahead, Sarah, what do you think? Well, what's he gonna do? I guess it depends what you're gonna do with them. I like a vine ripened tomato. That to me is one of the great joys of the summer. At the end of the season, yes, the green tomatoes, you put them in bags and then you're really happy to have them. But to me, picking all those green tomatoes and letting them ripen like that is, is a crime. <laughs> if, if you're gonna just, if you're gonna make sauce and cook them down and put a million spices in them, I mean, it doesn't matter. But I would uh, protect my tomatoes on the vine. <laughs> so who likes the green tomato? version. The only time I would choose to take the tomatoes green is right before we know like a serious heavy rainfall is coming. And sure, you're not there's a weather event. If you want to save them from the split, right? So you want to get them right. on the vine. But other, I'm with right. you otherwise, keep them on the vine as long as possible. Yeah. yeah tomatoes are another thing. You know, you don't, you don't put tomatoes in the refrigerator, but my my happy mudroom, I keep a window air conditioner running in there all this time of year. And I put, put my tomatoes in that room and it keeps them cool, but not too cold. And they, you know, they keep nicely there for, for several days. I think Michael Pollan said a tomato is one one vegetable that once you eat it out of a garden, he, he said he'd never buy it again from the store. Exactly. Yeah, it, it is delicious. Right, but like, like you, I guess, you know, it depends on his conditions. And right, if there is a, a weather event coming and, and if the vines are starting to look pretty yeah. precarious, you know, if you see like you're, you're getting in trouble, then I might, I might pick a bunch. Yeah. But if everything's looking okay, then I, I, I leave them as long as I can. You can make green salsa. I think his feeling yeah. is that, that, that after, once, once these turn, once these ripen sitting on the table, once they turn red, the flavor will be the same, but you say it's not the same, it's inferior. No. Okay. <laughs> They'll be good, but th there's, you cannot get the same flavor unless you let it ripen on the vine. Says the Ohio girl. Where are you from in Ohio? Outside Cincinnati. Okay. Well, we're on to the weekly updates now. Um, maybe, but we're halfway through. Maybe now is the time for us to stand up and do that shimmy in place. What do we say? Yeah? So it's hard on a body to sit for an hour. We ask everybody to stand up and do their shimmy in place, uh, on camera, off camera, up to you. Back in a minute. Hey, Peter.
Okay, welcome back everyone. So yeah. um, at this point, we wanna to go to the weekly update. And I think Sarah was gonna go first and tell us about the community garden and then good old 029213 will, be, will go next and what's happening in his garden. <laughs> and, and then Alexandra has, has some the week's foraging tips for us. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Yeah. Well, the community garden, we're at the height of our tomato season which makes us all very happy. We planted 60 tomato plants this year and we've been giving um, a small bin of tomato, a decent sized bin of tomatoes to the uh, food pantry once a week. The um, crop is really good and it's, there's not too much blight, there's not too much cracking. There, um, we have different, a number of varieties, some beef steaks, some um, small cherry sized yellow tomatoes, paste tomatoes. So they'll probably be finishing up the heavy production in another week or two. Uh, the peppers are doing nicely. We planted some um, larger plants and some younger plants. So we'll have a pepper crop for probably close up to frost season. We have uh, bells. Um, the Italian frying peppers, hot peppers, habaneros, cubanellas, they're doing well. The beans are still producing, which is amazing. Everyone's already sick and tired of them, but they're mm -hmm. hanging in there. Um, squash plants are on their last legs. Have some squash bores and some uh, squash bugs got in. When it was really hot, we weren't paying too much attention to them. Sunflowers look fantastic. We grow flowers and our members really enjoy getting flowers to cut and take home. The, uh, I put in some more spinach, arugula, lettuce, and Swiss chard this week from seed. We'll see if it makes it. I'm gonna go over in the morning and water it. And those are the highlights of what's going on right now. So then we put more beets in down in our lower garden. So hopefully we'll have a nice beet crop around the end of October. What kind of beans do you have that are so prolific? There's, um, you know, there's snap beans, green and yellow. And are those bush beans or pole yeah, beans? Yeah, bush beans, bush beans. Bush beans. We also, you know, we have an irrigation system which helps. And even though it's been dry this year, we've gotten just enough really heavy downpours in late July and August that I think it was in July, it was really hot and dry. And then we remember we had some really good rainstorms. That just re-energized everything. And the other thing I forgot to mention is celery. We have a really nice celery crop. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Steve, you want to go next? Sure. <clears throat> so um, my, my garden has been pretty much along the lines of what Sarah said. Um, you know, I, I would pretty much ditto almost everything she said. I, I don't grow peppers this year, so um, haven't had those. But um, the one thing we have had is corn. And I harvested all my corn this past week really over the last two weeks, ever since we had the, uh, the tropical storm come through and all my corn plants were knocked down. And then interestingly, the, most of them righted themselves at least two thirds of the way. Um, but it was time to pick the corn because lying on the ground, it's, uh, it's available to, to uh, you know, animals. And so I picked and have been husking and cutting and freezing and eating. So that's one thing I've been doing. Um, also, I've harvested all my potatoes. I had a terrific potato crop this year in terms of uh, top growth. Um, unfortunately, despite the fact that when I dug some new potatoes, everything seemed to be fine, two, the, the two white potatoes, which were uh, Katahdin's and the Yukon Golds, had about a 50 or 60% loss due to a bacterial um, uh, disease uh, basically 
that causes soft rot. And so the yield was very poor on those, but the red potatoes, which my reds were red Pontiacs, uh, they were 100%. So out of 20 foot rows of each of the crops, I got about eight or 10 of the white and the, and the gold, and I got about 30 pounds out of the red, which was, which was very good, which is typically what I would expect, about 30 pounds per 20 foot row. Um, mm -hmm. I'm planting uh, collards, and I'm planting um, a kale that I've started as uh, started a few weeks ago in pots. And I've got lettuce, but I don't want to put the lettuce in the ground because it's just too hot and I don't have a cover for it. So I'm eating lettuce out of my pots. So other than that, beans, beans have been prolific and uh, we're still, still getting a lot of beans and freezing. Um, and then basil and flowers, like Sarah said, uh, it's been a great year for sunflowers and I've got lots of zinnias and they're doing well. One thing I, I just wanted to mention, I, I spoke early in the, uh, the growing season about um, asparagus and something that I never had before, and I, I'm wondering if anybody's had this experience. I went out to my asparagus field, which is about a uh, maybe 20 by 20 block. And I noticed, despite the fact that all the, all the fronds had gone up, and they're doing what they should do, which you let it, you let them grow, and then after they die back, you cut them down to the ground. I noticed quite a few asparagus spears coming up out of the ground about two weeks ago, so I picked them. So we had about a pound and a half of asparagus. I made nice asparagus risotto, and we had asparagus for a couple of days. So very unusual. Never had that before in the middle of the summer. Hmm. A little extra treat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and my Swiss shard. The, the Swiss shard's doing really well, except the birds have found it. So, um, <laughs> you know, we've got goldfinch that love to eat the Swiss shard, and so I'm really? playing the birds. Yeah. Oh, we have finches all over the garden, but they're they're happy with the sunflowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Vegetarian birds on on sunflowers. Some of our it seems like every year around this time. The leaves on our sunflower plants start dying from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Is that typical for a sunflower around here, yeah. or is there something yeah. in the soil? Or yeah, yeah, yep. Similar to the powdery mildew, sometimes they get almost like a white mildew on it. Yeah. Very good, thank you. And then, um, Alex, you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. I'm gonna do the spotlight video on you. There you are. Thank you. And then I'll, I'll show my screen a little bit. Um, all right, hi everyone, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm an herbalist. And um, this week I wanted to share a little bit about plantain. I was gonna talk about goldenrod, but then I realized as usual that I could spend an hour talking about one plant. So I figured we'll just keep it a plantain this time and then maybe next time. Um, hopefully goldenrod will still be in bloom and we can talk about goldenrod. I also wanted to mention something about the, um, the green tomatoes, <laughs> um, if I may. I, um, the way that I look at this is that in order for us to get um, nutrition from veggies and to break down that cell wall to really access all the nutrients inside the cells, the best way to do that is to cook our vegetables. And one of the ways that nature does that is with the sun. So that's one of the reasons why it's so nice to be able to have veggies from the garden from the CSA is because um, that makes it so much more easier to digest for us because the sun is really starting that cooking process uh, and the baking. So it was just something that, um, that I wanted to add to that because I think that's, um, that's something that I was trying to keep an eye on at the supermarket um, since most of the veggies there due to the cold chain, everything gets there green, right? And not, and not ripen. Um, all right, so let me share my screen. All right, so I wanna to talk today about a very, um, very well-known plant that I think all of us have seen. Um, and some of us know it pretty well. I think most people are familiar with this plant because it's a weed and it grows everywhere. And as I've mentioned before, the herbs that I work with are always accessible 
local grow around us. Um, I really consider herbs and plants to be, you know, medicine that belongs to everyone. And I really try to keep things very simple and not complicated and also to work with one herb at a time. Um, so plantain, there are two um, species that grow in this area. Uh, there is Plantago madris, which is the one here um, to the left, which I think we're the most familiar with. Um, so this one has um, these broad leaves um, that look kind of like the bottoms of, of the foot. That's where uh, uh, planta is coming from in Latin, it's from the bottom of the foot. Um, and they have these um, seed pods that tend to grow really, really tall, depending on where you live. Um, and sometimes, you know, kids like use them as stores to fight and you can also uh, play with the seeds and kind of like get them off of the, off of the stem and shoot them at your favorite person. Uh, they're really, really fun plants to play around with. Um, the other pl uh, plantain that grows around here is the lanceolata. This is the European plantain. It has a much uh, longer leaf, so less broad uh, than the magus. And the seed pod is totally different, which I'll show you um, in the next slide. But both of these species can be used interchangeably with the exception of the seeds, and you'll see why. Uh, they're a lot less abundant on the lanceolata. Um, but in terms of nutritional and medicinal properties, they can be used very similarly. Um, I would say that plantain, um, sorry, there's so much text on here. I'm, just, I'm gonna talk through it, you don't have to read it. Um, so it's pretty easy to identify. Um, usually the leaves are, um, they have five veins that are pretty distinct, especially if you look under the leaf. Um, and I would say that if you want to harvest this plant, make sure you find the right place to do it. Um, so plantain likes compact soil. So um, the Native Americans used to call it white man's foot because it literally grew on the pathways um, that the European used, Europeans used to walk on and the seeds stick to rubber so easily that they used to just kind of plant them along the way as they were walking. So they would have all these like foot trails of plantain. Um, so, you know, be careful where you harvest it from. I like to go in areas where there are footpaths, um, but, like that also have like big openings and pastures and they don't often mow and you'll see the plantain growing on the sides of that footpath and it will be you know nice um <clears throat> the leaves are going to be really really big not small like the picture i have here this is from my mowed lawn as you can see but the leaves are going to be really, really nice and large and the seeds are going to be really 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 tall uh it's not really worth harvesting the seed pods unless you get one that's like a foot or more. And I'll show you some of the ones that I harvested last week. Um, this, this little guy here, this is the seed pod of the European plantain. So really not worth harvesting. It takes a lot of work to harvest these. So I really like to go with, um, with, with the mages with, which have much larger, much larger seed pods. Um, <clears throat> So the leaves, and I like to work with the smaller, like the baby leaves. They're just a little more palatable, especially if you put them in your salad. If you cook them, it doesn't really matter. Just cook them for like 20, 30 minutes or more. Um, but they're really high in vitamin C. And this is really wonderful because plantain, just like dandelion, is one of the first plants to really come out in the spring. And it just lasts all through the season. Um, up until up until the fall. So it's really available to us throughout the whole season. It's really nice in the spring. Uh, you know, back in the day when vitamin C wasn't available during the winter, dandelion greens and plantain leaves were pretty much a staple uh, of, people's, of people's diets. Um, the leaves are very cooling. Um, they're moistening, they're emollient. Uh, they also contain some mucilage that's really nice for our, um, our respiratory membranes, our gut membranes. 
uh, and it's also astringent. Um, you probably already know this, but plantain is really famous for um, helping out with things like bee stings. Uh, and the reason why it's so good at that is because it is both emollient and astringent. So the emollient quality of the leaf when it's chewed up and used as a poultice really helps to draw out anything that's in the skin. And that includes everything from infection, so dead white blood cells, um, to foreign objects like splinters, um, to things like venom, so um, snake venom or anything, uh, bee sting venom, mosquitoes. And it really also helps close up that wound as antibacterial qualities. So it's really, really wonderful for any kind of like skin, skin abrasions. Not as great as something like yarrow, for example, but plantain is just so available that if you have any type of, you know, bites, wounds, burns, you can always just reach for it, chew it up and put it on your skin. It's also really wonderful um, if you have infected gums. So um, <clears throat> especially if you've had a root canal before and you have like a little bit of inflammation after that surgery, you can chew on some plantain and just leave it in that area and it would really have a nice cooling sensation. And it's just really, really, um, you know, it doesn't give you much pain relief, but it will give you that little bit of like release, especially if you have an infection that has like some pulse and like some palpitation there, it will also really help that calm down and of course drain anything that's in there and really move it out. Um, I really like also to work with it medicinally, um, it medicinally as a decoction or infusion. The mucilage in the leaves, is essentially the substance that, like I said, nourishes all of our respiratory mucous membranes, uh, as well as digestive mucous membranes, those are made of the same type of cells. Um, so it really helps bronchial infections or get rid of bronchial infections. It doesn't really work for anything that's like deep in the lungs, but anything that feels superficial, but is still you know, affecting the bronchi, it will help move some of that out and also really helps help soothe those irritated membranes. Um, the seeds is kind of what I really wanted to talk about. Um, so if you're going to harvest the seeds, um, you want to be looking for, so this is part of what I harvested. Uh, what you want to be looking for, and you can do this time of year. This is perfect. That's why I'm talking about this plant now. So this is how large the ones that you harvest are going to be. Usually uh, on your mowed lawn, they're going to be like little baby ones. It's not really worth it. We want to get like a good bank for a buck whenever we're working with herbs. Um, we don't want to spend too much energy harvesting. We want to spend more energy, you know, eating it. So um, you have to wait until the seeds are almost brown or this like dull green color and you can test it because they come off the, um, the stem really easily so they i mean you can't see them but um basically then when you get home you can dry them a little bit um and if you whenever you harvest pretty much anything unless you're going to eat it right after you harvest it make sure you do it not in the morning um because you don't want to have that dew so I usually harvest in the afternoon and then all you have to do is just pull the seeds um, and you get your nice little seeds with the husk on. Um, this is one of the plants where the husk is really, really important. Um, it is the combination of the seed itself and the husk that creates, um, that creates a really nice effect on the digestive system. Um, so Metamucil is actually made from plantain seeds. Um, so it does have a laxative effect because it's tons of fiber, but it's the mucilage in the seed that helps um, alleviate some of the potential irritation that comes along with working with a very strong fiber slash laxative on your stomach. So that's why it's really, really important to keep, um, to keep the husk on. If you dry the plantain seeds, um, you're gonna end up with the husk like in your um, on your screen. So usually I have to put a piece of um, uh, 
a paper towel underneath to catch everything to make sure I keep it. Otherwise, it will just fall off. Um, one place I ever like to go to that it's been growing really nicely. I got these from um, Skinamonk um, State Park. There's like this really nice, um, you know, open field at the bottom that has like tons of medicinal plants. It's where I'm going to harvest milkweed later on in the season. Um, but it has just some beautiful plantain growing as well as goldenrod, which we'll talk about next time. Um, but yeah, you can also um, make infused oil from the, the leaves if you want to preserve them. So it's pretty easy to make. You can just cut up the leaves into small, small pieces, put them in a jar, add some olive oil, let it sit for six weeks, make sure they're all covered. Otherwise, they will get. Um, they may get um, some, some mildew, they will get moldy, but that oil is going to be really nice because you can use it all through the winter and make cells with it. Um, and what else? You can also dry the leaves and eat them later on during the year. Um, I dry them throughout the whole season, so I have plenty you know, um, to cook with during the winter. Um, and what else did I want to say? Um, I think that's it about plantain. Yeah, so far. Um, do you guys have any questions? So this plantain considered as a weed, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, Yeah, I think that most people, so I like to work with weeds, um, not only because they're very abundant and yeah. provide us a lot of nourishment and they grow very close to us, um, but also because um, I think they have a very strong relationship with humans. They like to grow near humans. Um, and oftentimes you'll find them, you'll find the, the weed that you need the most to work with like growing near you and growing in abundance near you. So mm -hmm. it, it very much has a relationship with our needs and our environment. So I really, really like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. I was out, in, I was out in the woods back behind this late last week and noticing that the Japanese knotweed was growing in there. Do I have a strong need for Japanese knotweed? What's going on here? So that's really, really interesting. So um, the interesting thing about Japanese knotweed is that it is a very effective remedy against COVID, as well as against the SARS viruses. So it's really, I think it's really amazing that everybody's starting to notice Japanese knotweed growing around them um, because it just feels very, very timely. Um, Although right now is not the best way to harvest it. It's really early spring, the young shoots. Those are really the most um, effective against, uh, against the virus. It actually, um, it stops um, the, the binding to the cilia or to the surface of the cilia. And that's really how it helps. Um, there's an excellent um, article written by Steven Buhner about Japanese knotweed uh, as amongst a million other herbs that helps with, uh, with COVID. Also, um, it's a really wonderful remedy against um, Lyme disease. Oh. Mm. So um, Japanese knotweed tincture especially is, has, been, has been shown to be effective against um, secondary infections uh, from Lyme disease. Mm. So it's also, yeah, so it's, it's really great that it's so abundant. Mm. Steve is saying something, but he's on mute. Yes. Is there, is there a way of using uh, plantain, um, collecting it and using it when it's not fresh, other than making the oil infusion? And I'm thinking about when it's, it's great to have it. I see it all the time and I've used it, uh, particularly as a poultice, but um, I'd like to be able to take it, for instance, on a camping trip when I'm gonna be in the woods and I'm not going to have easy access to it. Um, can you, can you uh, 
blend it or chop it up and, and mix it with water or something and keep it in a jar? What's the best way of doing that? Um, yes, yeah, so the best way would be to make it into a salve with the oil. Um, okay. If you, what you can also do is, um, this is a lot more difficult to me, but you can make like a clay-based salve. Hmm. Uh, it's a little more complicated, but usually just like the, the the infused oil and some beeswax to create like a nice hard salve will really, really help also maintain its, cons its consistency right. um, during the summer. Um, I also would, um, in a very polite way, challenge that because I think you will find plantain in the woods anywhere you are. Yeah. And every time that I'm out there, I always look for it. And I'm always, I always tell myself, there's no way I would find in the middle of the Adirondacks. Like there's just like, you know, it's not, not part of the natural environment there. And then I will see like one plant randomly. So it is, it is around. Um, it's just not going to be like as obvious and abundant as it is, you know, um, in the most like pop, in the more popular areas. But anywhere where there's like a small clearing, yeah. you will see weeds growing there. And plantain will probably be one of them. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, uh, Alexander, thank you so much. Just on the thank basis you. of time, I, I'd like to move ahead to the announcements and we, we want to talk about tools. Maybe we'll do that next time. But um, uh, we have some announcements and we'll go through them quickly. It's hot out there. Um, Nicole isn't with us this week and I have that she's there's pictures on display. Excuse me, it's her artwork on display. It's a, this is not my, you know, there's, I think it's down in Stanley Deming Park on the railroad green. She says her, her work is on the railroad green. They're, they're not pictures, they're sculptures. Yeah, sculptures. Very, very nice job she did. Yeah, so, great. Oh. so please get down there. We didn't see her tonight, but um, Sustainable Warwick is doing a fundraiser for the Warwick area migrants community. If you take a picture of anything about local food, something from your garden, something from the farmer's market, and you sent it to Chad, right, who's right here. Uh, Sustainable Warwick will donate 20 bucks for every picture to the AMC up to 1,250. Um, and we'll put your picture in with our collection and we've got this really cool collection of uh, local food picks going there. Um, if you know anyone, uh, I don't have time, we don't, I don't want to take time to explain this. If you know anyone who thinks they should learn to more, cook more. They want to do more cooking. There's something called cooking in the deep end. It's where you, you only eat food if you cook it yourself. And you undertake this challenge for like a month or two in order to get your cooking up to the next level. I know a young man who's doing it right now. We'd sort of like to find a couple other people who want to learn to cook this way. Just, you know, they're not going to cook with each other, but they could be, you know, in contact and helping each other. Contact me if you, if you're, anything about that um let's jump to the last one peter live yeah you've got a you've got a weekend workshop that you want to invite everyone to yeah i uh the orange environment uh, invite me as well as my uh, master gardener to work out a program on the weekend which is a saturday 12 saturday in the morning session we are talking about nature building using the natural material to build your structure, such as oven, outdoor oven, using natural material, sand, clay, stone, grasses, those natural material. And in the afternoon session, we are going to provide you a 55 gallon drum to draw a hole and you collect the water from your roof. So it's a rainwater catchment uh, installation. And those two programs, one in the morning, one in the, in the afternoon, it's on September 12th. And another program is about mushroom, grow mushroom in your backyard. That will be in October 10th. So you want to know more about the detail, I appreciate you can check Orange Environment website. They are all the detail. Uh, about these two programs. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Peter. And you'll send us literature for that we can share with people, right? You've got brochures and things for those events, right? Yeah. Yes. And I, I, I posted that uh, today, actually, on my Facebook page. It's doing very well. 
Oh, okay. Okay, so folks, we're out of time. Did anybody, does anybody have a favorite gardening tool they just want to flash on the screen? Or if not? I, I'm just going to jump in one, one second. I, I have a, a couple of garden forks that I really love. I don't have pictures of them. But my forks are old and they, the, the wooden handles have broken. Does anybody know where I can get replacement wooden handles for old garden forks? Well, you may want to consider the repair cafe. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> one of the coaches. I've oh, done okay. my repairs. <laughs> oh, I, I've okay. repaired my own. Um, oh, oh. But, but they're, they're, um, they're in need of greater repair. So oh, okay. keep looking, but thank you, folks. You, yeah. you know, I've got, I've got like a bunch of old shovels and stuff back in the tool shed. Some of them rarely get used. <clears throat> Could you like swap it out of something that's sort of eh? Sort of mental yeah, method, not use them. Possible. Much. Yeah, it's possible. Okay, at the end of the growing season, I'll get in touch with you, Michael. Okay. Right. And Michael, I just want to make, uh, just mention to everyone that, you know, I guess we're not going to be having the next Zoom because it's uh, Labor Day. So I don't know if the next one is going to be on the 13th or uh, what date it will be exactly. But uh, just letting what? you guys know that in advance. So what do we say? Maybe go for a we either go for a three week interval or a four week interval. What, what do people think? Silence. <laughs> I actually heard some white noise in there, which is uh... <laughs> So we could take a three week break or a four week break. Do you guys have any uh, opinions? Otherwise, Michael and I and Sarah will decide, but I think we'll decide. My opinion's a three week break. Three. All right. Three so the years. third. Okay. Three third. Years. Thank you. We appreciate you guys coming, and uh, we will see you in three weeks. Thank you both. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Gail. Gail, are you still there? Um, guys, thank you very much. Yes, I'm. I'm still there.